Hey, folks, we're going to talk about the exclusive right to represent buyer agreement. This is from the form of NVAR, the Northern Virginia Association of Realtors, and we'll get right down to it. So we start at the top here that you're having an exclusive right to represent the buyer agreement. This is between um, the brokerage and the purchasers that you're going to be working with. You have to have a start date here and uh, the first blank. Buy in between, you have the buyer's names, buyer two optional, uh, then you have their last names, uh, or buyer three and buyer four, and then insert the name of the firm, which is KW, KW United. This one is Falls Church, but we also have Kingstown. And then it, the first things we start pointing out is what is our relationship? The appointment of the broker. In consideration of services and facilities, the broker is hereby granted the right to represent the buyer in the acquisition of real property. Number two, what's the buyer's representation? You want to make sure that not only are you representing what you're going to do as the brokerage, but what is the buyer agreeing to here? So the first thing we have here is that the buyer is not a party to any other agreement with any other brokerage firm. They also represent that the buyer has disclosed to the broker information about any properties they've previously visited uh, at any new homes, communities, or resale open houses. So that helps me understand, are we gonna come across any potential challenges to someone wanting to pay me and uh, say that they are represented or not represented by uh, KW United? Um, so we wanna make sure that we understand what have you shown, um, what have you been shown by other um, uh, agents in new home developments and what we need to do to uh, make sure that we're showing that we're representing you on those if we go back and purchase them. Notices, all notifications and amendments under the agreement will be in writing. Everything in Virginia has to be in writing. You can't just say something. And that's why when you alter this agreement or you have a discussion with your buyer, it's a good idea to go back and uh, reiterate what you said by email. So we have the mailing address, the city, state, zip code, uh, the phone, get as much information here as you can. And then the broker information uh, goes in this section here. Term and termination. We agree that we're going to work on this and I'm going to get compensated. Expires at 11.59 p.m. on and you have a certain date. Now, with buyers in today's market, I would I would not really take something for less than four to six months um, because it's it's going to take that long to, uh, to get them to uh, contract. Uh, once you're under contract, if this terminates during that contract period, that's not a problem. You're still on board to get paid and to represent them. But um, you just need to know that the, the expiration date is whatever you're putting in here and that um, that you want to make sure that you know how long you're going to be working together. Uh, in the event buyer wishes to terminate the agreement prior to the expiration date, let's say, you know, we got it six months out without good cause, um, you know, month number four, they decide they don't want to work with you anymore. The buyer will compensate broker X an early termination fee. So that's to kind of help you pay for your expenses. Um, you know, a lot of agents, um, they get nervous about putting anything down that they're going to owe, be owed by the buyer. Don't do that. You're in business. This is what you do. You're driving around, you're spending time and you're spending resources, gasoline, oil, tolls, um, probably lunches here and there. And so there's nothing wrong with you getting an early termination fee. Um, and, you know, we can talk about that at a different time, what that number should be. What are the broker's duties? I'm going to promote the interests of the buyer. I'll say right here, right now, and there's a confidentiality sentence here. Loose lips sink ships. Whatever your buyer's telling you, there is a few things that you can share with other people uh, with that, what the buyer's telling you. Predominantly, I'm looking for a house in Annandale. I need it at $650,000. They got to have three bedrooms, two and a half baths with a fenced in backyard. That's fine. Telling them that, you know, um, they need all that and they're getting divorced or their mom's moving in with them or their kids are moving out. That's a lot of information you don't really have to give to people across the table. So uh, you want to give them uh, people information about what they need to do uh, to buy the property, but you don't want to you know, sell your buyer out by giving up too much information. Anyway, back to uh, 5A, you're going to be, I'm going to seek property at a price and terms acceptable to the buyer, presenting in a timely manner all written offers or counter offers to and from the buyer, disclosing to the buyer all material facts related to the property that you know about, 
and concerning the transaction of which they have actual knowledge. So this means you're getting documentation going back and forth during the negotiation of this. You want to get that information to your buyer as soon as possible. You know, we work nights and weekends, so be okay with the fact that you're going to be sending stuff over to the listing agent um, and to the buyer off hours. That's just the kind of the way it is. I mean, you do want to have some time where they're, I'm not interfered with. Look, I'll work till seven o'clock. I'm available. But if something comes in and you're negotiating, it's hot and heavy. You might be sending stuff out at 12, uh, at 10 p.m., uh, you know, 11 p.m., 1 a.m. It just depends on what the situation is that's going on. But you want to get that offer, counter offer, related information to the buyer um, at a very quick amount of time. E, I'm going to account for a, in a timely manner all money and property received in which the buyer has or may have an interest. This is predominantly talking about your EMD, the earnest money deposit. This is something you're going to have to hound them about to make sure they get that in. In today's world, most contracts that I've dealt with say, hey, we'll get the EMD to you um, within X number of days of ratification. The challenge we have is a lot of contracts ratify on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, usually Saturday and Sunday. So if you say three days and you've ratified Saturday, Sunday a, is a day, um, you know, and so they need to understand I got Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, if I've said three days. And so you are, uh, it's up to you that you'll get that money to where it's supposed to be going up to you to manage that. It's up to them to perform that. So make sure that they get that earnest money deposit into the appropriate parties uh, within the timeline. Unless otherwise provided by law or buyer or, or buyer consents in writing to the release of the information, buyer will maintain the confidentiality of all personal and financial information and other matters identified like we just talked about before during the brokerage of the relationship. Um, if it's after the relationship, you still want to hold into confidence those things which were handed to you in confidence. Um, the final piece here, in addition, broker may show the same property to other buyers, represent other buyers on the same or different properties, represent sellers relative to other properties, or provide assistance to a seller or prospective seller by performing ministerial acts that are not inconsistent with broker's duties under agreement. Why do you think that's put out there? Most likely when you've done an open house or you've got a listing and you're getting leads off of that price range, most likely you're going to be running into people that are looking for the same price, location, and type of property. So you're just letting them know, look, I'm a real estate agent. This is what I do for a living. So if you see something you like, great, but let's get going on writing on it because I have another person here that might be wanting to buy as well. And so you're just letting them know, I do real estate. This is what I do. And so therefore, I may be showing properties to other buyers who are interested in the same property that you're interested. The buyer's duties work exclusively with the broker during the term of the agreement. They're going to pay you directly or indirectly the compensation set forth below. And we'll talk about that in just a minute, how you get paid. Comply with the reasonable request of broker to supply any pertinent financial. Don't drag your feet. You know, time is of the essence. Be available during broker's regular working hours to view properties. Buyers advised against and assumes responsibility for taking, posting, publishing, or displaying any photo or video recording of any property. We have professional photos online. So I never really understand why people want to walk around with their camera and take even more pictures. So you want to kind of encourage them, don't be taking pictures of others, people, houses. There are photos online that we can go through on that. Um. And then it goes on to say, if you do do that and something happens and you get sued, I'm held harm, har harmless and and uh, re released from any liability. Also, make sure the buyer knows that in today's world, you may be walking into a property that has live video and audio recording systems in place. So you don't want to be talking about all the things you might do in that property to put an offer in Um in the house. You want to have those discussions outside. You want to have those discussions um, in the car or in the office and not necessarily in the house or on the front stoop where there might be a, a ring camera or something like that that's recording information. Purpose. What are you hiring me for? Following type of property, residential. What I usually put, that's what we're usually working with. Compensation. All right. So retainer fee, broker acknowledges receipt of a retainer fee in the amount of blank, which will or will not be subtracted. Some agents charge a retainer fee. 
Some don't. If you decide to charge a retainer fee, charge a retainer fee for everyone. If you give a break on that, give a break for everyone. Um, and so this would be a fee that you would use to um, to pay for expenses of going out and showing properties and the gas and stuff like that. Most of these I see have zero, just so you know. The payment will pay compensation in the amount of blank. Now, the buyer's on the dime to pay you. I would submit that probably 90 to 99% of the transactions will come from the settlement table. And it looks like paid by the seller. Um, and in their agreement, they have some sort of agreement with the listing agent to offer out a commission. And that's true. It's coming from their side of the table. I would submit that when you're talking about compensation, the seller's offering the equity. You're offering the cash from the from the bank. So both together, you're putting together how much you're going to get paid. But in a buyer broker agreement, I see a lot that say in the amount of what's offered in the MLS. The challenge you have with that is that sometimes you're showing a property that's not in the MLS. Um, so you need to have something in there. And uh, what we would say is to put in the minimum amount that you would be willing to take from the buyer if the buyer had to pay you. So they will pay you compensation in amount of one, two, three percent, whatever you decide, two and a half or a flat fee. If the buyer enters into a contract to acquire real property during the term of agreement and goes to settlement on that contract anytime thereafter. And then this is where you talk about um, that there may be compensation that comes from the table and talks about how this gets paid out. Do not say that my services are for free. They're not for free. You're getting paid and someone's paying you. Okay. So your services are not for free. Um, the broker may retain any additional compensation offered by the seller or seller's representative, even if this causes the compensation paid to broker to exceed the fee specified above. So let's say you're getting 2% in here, but you actually get 25 or 3% from the listing agent. So you're getting more than what they said here, but all of that goes to you. That's what that paragraph is saying. If within X days after expiration or buyer's to early termination of agreement, buyer enters into a contract to acquire any real property of the type discussed in the purpose paragraph, the buyer owes you a commission. I usually put about 30 days in there. The assumption is like, hey, we went shopping from January to June. And then in mid-July, um, you went back to one of the properties and got under contract. They owe me, uh, my company, they owe me the commission. Um, the only out on that is that they've entered into an enforceable contract to acquire real property during the term of agreement buyer defaults under the terms of that contract. So any obligation that they have for you to pay you ceases when they've signed up with another brokerage. Are they in a relocation program? Very important that you get the answer on this. Yes or no. What's the name of the program? Who's the contact name? What are the terms? The idea on this is a lot of relocation programs are counting on money from the agent that that buyer or seller is working with to get money to pay them back. So they're counting on getting a 30, 40% referral fee from you to pay them the relocation uh, package. So keep that in mind. You got to know whether they're in relocation or not. This uh, paragraph 10 goes through the types of real estate representation and what is available here. This is on a lot of forms that we have. So um, I'm going to go through it in depth here since this is the beginning of our training course. And then after this, I'll say refer back to the buyer agreement so you understand what this is. It's also in the useful information form, useful information on transaction form. It's also on there. Seller representation, obviously the agent represents the seller. Buyer representation, the agent represents the buyer. Underneath buyer representation, there's a, a couple of different types in Virginia. One is designated representation, which is I'm in dual agency. You know, KW United has both the buyer and the seller. So I'm in dual, okay, in, in the brokerage world. But the broker has designated me as the buyer agent. Okay, so you're the designated agent. The buyer does not consent to designated representation or the buyer does consent to designated representation. Pretty much most of the time you want to have yes on that on every time. This is a dual representation under dual agency. Understand there's agency and there's representation. Okay. Dual agency, dual representation. Dual agency is KW United. It has both the buyer and the seller. 
Dual representation means KW United has the buyer and the seller, and the one agent has the buyer and the seller. In our office, our company, we do not, um, we don't participate with dual representation. We feel like that each party needs their own realtor. And if you come across that, then we can talk about how to deal with that. But you would say does not consent to dual representation. Thus, buyer does not allow broker to show properties owned by a seller represented by this broker through the same representative. Okay. Compliance with fair housing laws, another, another paragraph that's going to show up on a lot of forms. And these are the seven protected classes and some from the Commonwealth of Virginia, which they are race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familial status, whether they're married or not or national origin, as well as all classes protected by the laws of the United States, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and local jurisdictions. So in some local jurisdictions, there's higher levels of classes. Like, for instance, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, we have no discrimination based on elderliness, okay? Uh, Maryland has one based on age. So it's it's different classes, but there are different laws that are avail- that are there in the fair housing statutes on the state level that don't violate the federal, but they're addition to the federal. So keep that in mind. Attorney's fees. If any party breaches agreement, this is between the brokerage and the buyer. Remember, we're talking about the brokerage and buyer in this agreement, not the buyer and the seller, that whoever loses is going to pay for the the fees of the uh of the um of the the winner. So that's what this paragraph is about. And, and how that happens and, and who the prevailing party is and who pays and what party means and what legal expenses means and all that good stuff. The buyer does or does not hold an active or inactive real estate license. In the state of Virginia, a buyer has to tell the seller if they have a license, whether it's inactive or, ina- or, or active, I have a license. It's the way that the state requires us as licensees to let the other party in the transaction know I have a higher level of understanding and, and and learning in the real estate transaction. So yes, do you have one, not have one, even if it's inactive, which means it's inactive, it's with the state, but it's not expired. It's not terminated. Disclaimers, professional services. Uh, the buyer acknowledges that the broker is being retained solely as a real estate agent and not as an attorney, tax advisor, lender, appraiser, et cetera. The broker can counsel on real estate matters, but if buyer desires legal advice, they need to talk with an attorney, okay? Um, Megan's Law, this is the sex offender law, and there's a link here in the buyer broker agreement, and that that's on the buyer to go to this website and look up the areas that they're interested in to see if they want to purchase there, uh, if they don't like what they find as far as the presence of sex offenders in the community. Wire fraud, this is a huge thing that's going on in uh, the area of um, of real estate transactions. And you need to make sure people understand the wire fraud usually happens at the time you're, you're going toward closing. That's why we like working with a universal title. We have a portal that we use called qualia.com and several other title companies use that portal. It brings everyone to communicate inside that portal rather than through email. And many times this wire fraud, wire fraud is perpetrated through email saying, hey, we wanted to firm up where you're going to send your money and click this link to put in your information. And it looks exactly like the title company you've been working with. Uh, looks like whoever you've been working on the other side. It's a, it's a hacker, a, a spammer. They're trying to fish out the information from you to get your information to transfer it to their account. And once it's over there, guys, there is no way we're going to get that back. Um, I'm very familiar with how this works and I've seen it happen in transactions before. And it's very, very, um, it's very tragic when this happens. So make sure they understand why fraud is real and that the only numbers they need to be giving to people are the only people they need to be giving their numbers to are the folks at the title company. Okay. And, uh, and, and verify that it's the title company you're talking to whenever you get a phone call or an email or something like that. Service provider referrals. Um, if I refer you to someone, uh, the way I tell people about uh, service providers is, hey, look, you know, this is my contractor. I've worked with them on many, on many occasions. Many of my buyers and sellers have worked with them. They've had good experience, but here's his name. You don't want to say they're the most wonderful person in the world. You're never going to have anything go wrong. You don't want to give that kind of warranty to them that this is a perfect vendor. You want them to have the control of accepting the vendor or letting go of the vendor. 
Keeping in mind, most people don't have a home inspector in their home. They Most of them don't have a painter, electrician, or a, a radon company in their phone. So they are relying on you to get advice, but this is just a paragraph to let them know, look, I'm referring these people. They have a reputation to get it done, but it may not be perfect. And, you know, you can't hold me. Um, you can't hold me accountable for if something goes sideways. Miscellaneous agreement, any exhibits and any addenda signed by the parties constitute the entire agreement between the parties and supersede any other written or oral agreements between the parties. Agreement can only be modified in writing. So if you're changing something here, hey, will you give me a rebate? Hey, will you pay for my home inspection? Will you do X, Y, or Z? You can agree to do that, but you got to get it in writing that you're going to do that. Okay. It has to be in writing. Okay. Okay. And that is the end of this agreement. So the way this is uh, sent forward, you send this to your buyers through DocuSign, and then you send it to the broker sales manager for final signature. We will not sign before they sign. Okay, we wanna make sure that if they start marking this up or whatever, that um, we're going to have them have signed off on it first, and then we'll sign the final document. And then below this little hashtag or this, you know, kind of perforated line here is the buyer's agent information and then the supervising brokerage contact information. Okay. All right. That's it on the exclusive right to represent buyer agreement. And if you have any questions, feel free to uh, contact me and we'll help you out with whatever you need to get done. Take care.